Since our fellowship started, right, it started at a time when American cities weren't doing all that great. And um, well, uh, because of every single person in this room, our cities are doing much better. So nice job. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, but we've also created a whole bunch of new kinds of problems, and that's the, that's the beauty of being a city planner. They're just, uh, just never-ending uh, things to do. Um, so our session is about innovative approaches to, uh, for the just city. And um, I was, I'm a former planning director. I was a planning director in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, you know, a Rust Belt city that had been losing population. And I was a planning director in Denver, Colorado, a growing western city. And I've do been doing work in Los Angeles and Austin and Memphis and Milwaukee again and uh, in Houston. And it's interesting to me that um, a great deal of what our challenges seem to be is undoing a lot of the dumb stuff that was being done in the past. And this is really, really um, kind of frustrating because nature itself presents us with enough challenges. But, um, you know, innovation is, when we think about innovation and government, it's, um, it's a little bit challenging having worked in government uh, and driving innovation. And there are a lot of challenges about making innovation happen and how to make it sticky and how to make it last um, because we often are in this context of you know Einstein's definition of insanity right you do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result well this is not what we can do but the context of both private sector and public sector um, the momentum uh, is not easy to overcome and so in uh, Harriet's presentation um, and, and Nigel's, I think, we'll be hearing a lot about the sort of core leadership that's required in order to bring innovation, uh, especially into the government context. Implementation. We often say as planners, right, planning is human and implementation is divine, right? Action is eloquence. This is what we lobes do. We think a lot. We think a whole lot, but we do a lot. Um, and, you know, in doing so, we've, we've found ways and we develop ways to engage communities. Uh, from the ground up. And it's about not empowering. We don't actually have the ability to empower anybody. I have zero power, right? What we do is we create the opportunities for people to empower themselves. And um, so Dan will be talking about um, some of his work uh, with Interboro. And another part of what I think we'll look for in all these presentations is that, well, just to remember that the one thing is it's not about one thing, right? In cities especially. You know, unlike in the past where the one thing, the solution was to build a bunch of highways, right? There's no neighborhood that got better when a highway was cut into it. I've not found any. Uh, this is how kids walk to school uh, in Denver. Nice that they live close enough to walk. Uh, unfortunate that that's the environment that they have to walk. Um, and, uh, but every city that has taken a freeway out has gotten better, so it's not, impossible to think that we can improve our cities this way. And uh, uh, Ian Lockwood, who was uh, in the class of 2012 with me and a number of other wonderful lobes, um, made this very simple drawing. He, he makes these wonderful drawings. But really, I think, explains this thing about it's not one thing. And as we think about the physical capacity of streets in the public realm that we build, uh, we need to think about it in multiple terms. Um, and Anthony Flint wrote a great book. Um, about Jane Jacobs, and she gave us the right perspective, that it's not one thing, uh, it's multiple things. And so um, we've got three speakers. Um, they're going to speak for 12 minutes or so each, uh, and then we're going to bring them all together because the whole purpose of this is an interchange. And I know you all uh, will have a lot of questions and a lot of things you want to talk about. So Harriet, will you kick us off? Good morning, everybody. Um, I think this is going to be a really fun weekend. I'm thrilled to be here. I've already had this conversation and this presentation twice this morning, so I know that uh, this is stuff that you guys are, are, are all working on. Um, and Peter kicked us off in a really good way um, by sort of saying, um, you know, we have, uh, we've been doing things for, in HUD's case, 50 years. It's our 50th anniversary this year. Um, and some of those things may not make a lot of sense. How many of you live in a city with an affordable housing issue? Okay, so. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's good for, uh, for business, right? The way that things are right now, it's not good for business, the way that, uh, that we've been doing it. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about what some of those uh, 
uh, what some of those issues are. But at a, in a fundamental way, we're always asking ourselves, what can we do to make housing more affordable? Um, how many of you are sharing housing on this trip with a Loeb or somebody else? Yeah, so sharing is something that makes housing affordable temporarily or permanently. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's what, uh, it, it happened a lot in what we used to call tenements. Um, and, and we used to have this thing called overcrowding, right? Um, so it's, always, it's, a it's a tried and true method of uh, making housing more affordable. And we're seeing, we're seeing some of it come back in a not so good way in some of our cities. Obviously, the, the way we would most like to make housing more affordable is to have people make more income. How many of your cities are considering uh, uh, increases to minimum wage laws? Okay, so yeah, that's, that's a really good thing. And, and there, we can talk a lot about why that might be. Uh, at HUD, we're trying to do things to lower operating costs. We're trying to do a lot with energy efficiency and renewables because low-income households are spending 14% or more of their household budgets on energy. Um, you know, we spend, oh, I want to say, uh, I want to say six billion dollars a year at HUD just on energy costs on utilities. So we'd love to lower that cost. Um, we'd like to get more supply out there. That's part of why HUD was created. That's part of why so many of the programs HUD runs uh, were originally designed to actually increase the supply of housing. We can talk a little bit about why that may not be working so well now. Um, sometimes we, we do other things like we try to lower transportation costs, and of course. We subsidize housing, right? That's our biggest thing that we do. We subsidize housing. But where do those subsidies go? Ooh, gee. Um, how many of you live in, in subsidized housing? Exactly. You, if you itemize home mortgage interest deduction, you are the big winner. Congratulations. We're spending between 100 and $170 billion on you um, to subsidize your housing. We're like the only country in, a, in the world that does this. Right, and, and it causes us to overconsume housing relative to other types of assets. We also give you a, give ourselves a great break if we sell that housing. Capital gains. What other category of investment can you shelter? You know, up to five hundred thousand dollars if you're a married couple every two years of capital gain. Whoa, there's a big thumb on the scale for middle and upper income households. It doesn't, it does not um, skew evenly, right? And look at what we're spending. That's our, our annual budget at HUD. Light, if you add LIHTC, Low Income Housing Tax Credits. So you can sort of see we have an enormous amount of money in this country we're spending on subsidies, but it's not going to the people who need the subsidies. So that's the system we're working in right now. And it is a system, right? It's absolutely a system. Um, it's, and it's led to the result that Peter's already alluded to, and for very natural reasons for any one decision you might make it seems very logical to make that decision because um, you know this is really complicated you know you don't have to be an entitlement community it's an option for a city so you can opt out right so you don't ever have to take any HUD money you know to do this work so that that's part of the system we've come up with these alternate ways of uh, financing housing uh, Peter's old boss used to say, have, you know, having a separate financing system for affordable housing is like growing affordable food on affordable farms. You know, a whole separate system just for this. It's a little crazy. It is a little crazy. And it means that it's complicated and only specialists can really do it. It's not part of the regular housing market. LIHTC, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, is a whole another type of financing. It, it produces a lot of housing, um, but it but it also, where, how we distribute those credits sometimes ends up really reinforcing and reconcentrating poverty. Low land cost bias, right? I have, uh, I've talked to so many developers who say, gee, if I didn't have to put this affordable housing here, if you didn't make me put it here, I could give you many more units. If we just moved it to a place with lower land cost, and, and, and it sounds logical at, for, in any given transaction, but if you look at the pattern, that means, yeah, all the affordable housing slides down to the lowest income neighborhoods, to the lowest cost property. And guess what? That is where all your poverty gets concentrated. Proximity to supportive service, a similar argument. So we have a system that, that looks logical, and for every decision that we try to make, it produces uh, a logical answer, and we end up with a pattern. So that's part of why uh, we have published a rule at HUD called Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing uh, in July. It's, um, it is a, um, 
not a new thing. Ever since the Fair Housing Act was enacted in 1964, we've had this requirement, but it was always kind of a question how uh, this would actually be implemented, how you knew you were complying with the requirement. So we're making a, it a lot clearer in this rule, um, providing for a, a whole set of planning tools that would make it a lot more likely that people were successful in addressing these patterns of segregation. The purpose is to really look at those things. So the biggest pieces that we're giving people are new data, national data, and new tools. And so this is an example of uh, an opportunity index that was created in Baltimore. And in this case, you can see the darker the color, the more the opportunity, the lighter the color, the, the less it is. And this is a composite index. Uh, in Baltimore, they actually did it for a dozen different uh, types of characteristics, educational outcomes, safety, uh, life expectancy and health, all kinds of things. And the center of the city, um, you know, when, for the education slide, it was entirely yellow. Like there wasn't any part of it where the, the good educational outcomes were coming from any, any part of the city. It was really pretty astonishing. Um, and I'm gonna come back to these, the, the, the issue of these maps in a minute. Um, so part of what you have to do is basically uh, do an assessment of fair housing, looking at uh, racial and ethnic concentrations of poverty, but also most importantly, to link those fair housing goals to your planning and implementation. So you get home money in an entitlement jurisdiction, um, and you might be getting also CDBG. This applies to public housing authorities. Um, you have to submit a plan in order to be able to use your money. So this assessment is supposed to be tied to your planning process, which it, and then in turn is, is tied to how you're gonna spend the money to change these outcomes. So at HUD, I'll be, I'll be very blunt and frank with you, we have two theories of change going on at HUD. One of them is an enforcement theory of change. Uh, I know that a lot of our Loeb alum work for fair housing groups and, and enforcement is an incredibly important part of this whole equation, but there are other theories of change. So I used to work at EPA where we had something called the toxic release inventory. Anyone know what that is? Okay, there we go, we got one in Betsy Otto. Um, you know, uh, if I ever have a question in a room full of lobes, I know someone will have the answer, so that is really reassuring. The, um, it, it was basically a disclosure requirement for toxic chemicals. You didn't have to do anything to release, uh, to, to, to reduce the amount of toxics that you had, you just had to report it. Um, but it had a really shocking effect when companies had to publish the, the, the pounds, the tons, the thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of tons of chemicals that they were putting into the air, the land, and the water, they were horrified. They had never done a tally of it. They were shocked, they were embarrassed, they were ashamed. They drastically cut their emission of those chemicals. We didn't require it, it just happened because once they were presented with the information, it created all this cognitive dissonance and shame. When people start to see the maps um, you know, that, that, that show disparities, um, everybody believes they live in a community of opportunity. They believe that by, by dint of hard work and education, that in this country you can rise, you can have economic mobility, you can make things better for yourself and your family. But when people see these maps, they begin to recognize they are living actually in a different place. And that even though they thought they knew their community, they can see that, wait a minute, I can reach 80% of the jobs in my region within a half an hour from my location, and look over there. It's, it's two and a half hours to reach those same jobs. Well, who could spend that much time to get to a job? Well, that isn't fair. So, so the data, the, the, the information is, is galvanizing. It, in and of itself, because people think you know, in this country that that's what we're all about, the ability to, to, to do better, to do better for ourselves. And when they are confronted with the reality that their communities are not this, it, it makes a huge difference. This is a map of, of uh, DC where we looked um, at where market rate and affordable housing was going and saw that pattern I was talking about earlier, and it led us to create um, basically a, a requirement, a citywide requirement for inclusionary zoning, right? To, that's one answer to try to fix that problem, right? So 
So what we are uh, expecting to see, and we have some reason uh, to have this expectation because we did a pilot of, uh, of essentially 100 and, uh, I'm sorry, 70 different regions uh, who piloted the, uh, the AFFH rule at, with something called a fair housing and equity assessment. These maps come out of it. These quotes come out of it. Um, people were shamed. They were literally shamed by these maps. And they are, we didn't require them to act. They're all acting. They're all taking steps to, to get different outcomes because people believe in this country that everyone should have an opportunity to rise. And when they see that there are conditions in communities that, that, that undermine that ability, they, are, they have been, for these 70 communities and more, inclined to take action. And so that is certainly our hope uh, for the affirmatively furthering fair housing rule and that they'll begin to look at things like increasing access to transit, increasing density, allowing accessory dwelling units, um, you know, doing more to zone for multifamily housing, doing things to lower construction costs, all kinds of things that would give us, begin to give us different outcomes and so many more. Um, so I'm very optimistic and excited about this, op this opportunity um, that, uh, that, that the whole nation is going to be experiencing. Uh, my secretary, Julian Castro, former mayor, he calls HUD the Department of Opportunity. And I have to say it's a really uh, wonderful time to be there because I think we are on the verge of, of uh, doing what Peter suggested, uh, you know, taking a, a radical turn away from these long-standing segregated patterns of development uh, and really doing something about it. Thank you. Thank you, Harriet. And now, uh, Daniel Dioka. Okay. Uh, so thanks for the invitation to be a part of this, uh, of, uh, this panel. I'm not a lobe, um, uh, but I do have official FOL status. That's friend of lobe status. I think Jim Stockard gave me that once. Thank you, Jim. Uh, so uh, let's talk about wetlands. Uh, so, in Landscapes of Privilege, the Politics of the Aesthetic of an American Suburb, James and Nancy Duncan described the situational environmentalism of wealthy Bedford, New York. So in the 70s, the town introduced a series of laws to deter any new construction that might threaten its idyllic wetlands. Uh, yet, according to the authors, Bedford's wetlands codes did not necessarily uh, reflect heartfelt concern over environmental degradation. Rather, the laws sought to ensure the scenic value of the landscape, which could in turn preserve the property values, lifestyles, and identities of its elite or residents. Had Bedford leaders cared more deeply about the area's ecological integrity, they might have replaced the town's quaint dirt roads. Um, or voted to build a sewer treat, sewage treatment facility. Uh, instead, they strategically deployed environmentalist rhetoric in certain instances to reproduce the status quo, uh, obstructing development and preventing the arrival of new, perhaps different neighborhoods. Uh, so I thought uh, I'd start with this story because it's an example of how things like environmentalism and resiliency can be co-opted. Uh, and can be used to justify an exclusionary, nimbiest agenda. I like the story because it suggests that two can play that game. So can we uh, co-opt resiliency for an inclusionary, nimbiest, in my backyard uh, agenda? Hopefully we can. Uh, so for the past couple of years, I've been involved in something called Rebuild by Design. Uh, and uh, Rebuild by Design, we being Interborough Partners, my office, uh, and uh, it's an initiative of the uh, Hurricane Sandy Rebuilding Task Force and HUD. Uh, and it's focused on developing implementable, prototypical, catalytic design strategies uh, that improve regional resiliency. So it began as a multi-stage design competition launched in 2013. Uh, our team, the Interborough team, uh, consisted of a handful of US and Dutch firms, was one of the teams that was selected. And as a participant, we were asked to create resiliency plans for communities that were damaged by uh, Superstorm Sandy, and then basically compete for federal dollars on behalf of these communities. So for the first phase of work, uh, which we completed in October of 2013, we were asked to produce between three and five design ideas. These were not fully developed plans, uh, but uh, bold but implementable uh, design ideas for doing resiliency differently. Uh, so uh, we created four design ideas uh, for this, one for two for New Jersey, uh, one for uh, Monmouth County in New Jersey, one for the coastline, one for Long Island, and one for Staten Island. Um, a bit of background about why we picked these, these places to focus on. Uh, we were interested in uh, places, obviously, that were vulnerable to sea level rise. We were also interested in places that were economically vulnerable. 
interested in, in low and medium density uh, communities. We weren't interested in thinking about New York City or Boston. We wanted to pick places where there was a question about whether it was better to rebuild or protect or maybe even think about managed withdrawal. We were interested in areas that, were, uh, that housed uh, wastewater treatment facilities. So we get all these hot spots, and then we overlay it with the six-foot sea level six foot sea level rise, and we get a handful of communities. But I think we also wanted to, to look at different coastal topologies, so we wanted to pick a project that was uh, near a creek and near a freshwater marsh and near a bay uh, and near an ocean front. So again, we came up with these four projects. Now for the second phase, uh, which ended in April in 2014, the teams were asked to develop one of these design ideas uh, and take it to the next level. We were asked to develop our Long Island project, which you see up there. And for good reason, Long Island is really, really vulnerable. So this is southern Nassau County. Uh, and you see the, the extent of the Sandy damage. Uh, you see the category one surge. Category two surge, 113,000 structures are in the range of a category two surge, which is what Sandy was. Just to put that into perspective, that's what that looks like, okay? Uh, add to that sea, uh, six foot sea level rise, which is really a uh, surge in slow motion. Um, but it's not just problems from uh, coming up from the ocean, it's problems coming from the uplands as well. This is a map showing all the, the stormwater outfalls that drain stormwater uh, into these uh, rivers that run north-south. Part of the problem is that they just, the water goes unfiltered through these pipes and then into these streams, but, the high, but they're lower than the high tide line. So all it takes is a high tide and everything backs up and you get this problem. So there's water coming from every direction, right? And this leads to pollution because all the surface runoff water is going right into the bay. This creates a kind of negative feedback loop, right? Because that combined with wastewater that comes out of the bay undermines the, the marshes Right, and this is a terrible thing because marshes are good protection against wave runoff, so it creates this kind of negative feedback loop. Uh, okay, so this is the plan we produced. Uh, it's called Living with the Bay. And uh, so in a nutshell, it says, well, there's no one problem, so there can't be one solution. So it looks at five different strategies for addressing flooding in this region, uh, starting with the strategy for the, uh, the shoreline, the bay, the marsh itself, the rivers that run uh, north and south, and then in a, a, a strategy for building affordable housing outside of harm's way. Uh, so in 2014, this uh, plan was announced as a winner of the competition, was awarded $125 million for implementation. More accurately, one component, the slow streams component, which is this idea of rethinking these north-south streams that drain the stormwater runoff into the bay, that was uh, granted the money. Uh, and so now the slow streams thing is happening, and it's really exciting. So basically, we're looking to take these streams from something like this to something like this, widen them, soften them, store more water. Um, OK, so how do we uh, co-op resiliency for an inclusionary, envious agenda? Uh, so on Long Island, which was built on exclusion, building more inclusive environments, I think, is more important than ever. For a lot of Long Islanders, Sandy was a real wake-up call. But I think when Sandy uh, struck, Long Island had another sea change, a demographic sea change on its mind. So Lewis Mumford's you know, enduring image of a multitude of uniform, unidentifiable houses lined up inflexibly at uniform distances, you know, inhabited by people of the same class, et cetera, et cetera. I think that still strikes a chord, but Long Island is rapidly changing, no longer the uh, exclusive provenance of well-off, white, car-driving, nuclear families, these guys. Uh, Long Island suburbs are increasingly diverse, increasingly poor, and increasingly old. Uh, so just to look at some statistics, it's becoming a lot more diverse. It's becoming a lot older. So 1980 median age, 2011 median age. It's becoming poor. 1990 uh, families below the poverty level, 2012. Foreign-born population in 2000, foreign-born po population in 2012. Uh, so it's really changing. The household types are changing. Couples with children going down, other household types going up. And so there's a fundamental imbalance, right, between what Long Island's newcomers need and what the built environment has to offer. Uh, so for starters, look at these housing numbers. Long Island is almost all single-family owner-occupied homes. It does not work for everyone. So one solution that was part of our plan, uh, but that didn't get funded, but we're hoping to find funding for, is to use the recovery uh, money to build dense, affordable, transit-friendly ha uh, housing on Long Island's downtowns. So that's that line across the top of the screen. Right? It's out of harm's way, and uh, why not? This is what that line looks like. This is, uh, you could be on a train uh, here uh, that takes you to Manhattan in 20 minutes, and yet this is the development that exists around it. A lot of empty land, a lot of low 
a lot of low zoning, one story zoning, so there's no reason why we can't think about building housing here for people who most need it, a different kind of housing, right? So the idea is to create a network of sort of TOD development that would connect communities not only to each other, but down into the, the bay itself. I think one of the best things we could do to create more resiliency in the region is to create more opportunities for people to live in high and dry, high opportunity communities that are less prone to flooding. It's really simple. Unfortunately, uh, there's an obstacle to this seemingly simple solution. A lot of high and dry, high opportunity land in the region is inaccessible to low in income and minority persons because of exclusionary zoning tactics. Thankfully, a lot of states in the region have policies that require municipalities to build their fair share of affordable housing. Thanks also, of course, to HUD for affirmatively, further fair, uh, affirmatively furthering fair housing. But in New Jersey, for example, there's a Mount Laurel Doctrine, which obligates each municipality to provide its fair share of affordable housing. Many municipalities in the state have not complied with the mandate to do this, um, and therefore have a lot of unfulfilled obligations. Is there an opportunity here? We think so. So just to give you uh, one dynamic here, I mentioned one of our projects for an earlier phase was in Monmouth County, New Jersey. Look at that, the dynamic here, and let's look at this low land, uh, low opportunity, high land, high opportunity dynamic. By point of comparison, considering, consider low-lying uh, community Keensburg on the right uh, and the upland community of Hazlitt right next to it. Keensburg median family income is half that of Hazlitt's. Uh, the, the school rating coming from the state, uh, Keensburg gets a D, Hazlitt gets an A. Uh, according to the Municipal Opportunity Index, Keensburg is a minimum opportunity place, Haz Hazlitt is a maximum opportunity uh, index. It's higher, it's drier, and it has a, a 457 oblig uh, units of affordable housing that it has to build. There's a connection here, right? Uh, so this is uh, a project that we're also looking for funding to do. Uh, so this is looking at that same area. Now, the, the differences between lowland and upland communities, uh, uh, they came really into focus during Sandy, right? So um, here you see some newspaper stories. Well, over 1,000 homes uh, reportedly damaged in low-lying Keensburg, only 46 in, in Hazlitt up the way. You see some newspaper stories. Uh, nonetheless, there was some stories about cooperation, people upland in the same waters. This is the same watershed, right, feeling they had some obligation to help their low-lying neighbors. Um, and we asked ourselves, is there a way to encourage cooperation apart from this, this one emergency? And so for this, for this project, what we propose to do is create a connection between these communities by sort of playing up some of the natural connections that are part of this watershed. Uh, and leveraging to create social connections and improve the watershed. So first we want to make room for the creeks by widening it, similar to what we're doing in Long Island. Uh, we want to transform it into a recreational amenity. We want to uh, uh, make the creek accessible through trails. Um, we want to create, uh, it could look like this, we want to create incentive-based uh, programs in which people occupying land in a creek can trade their parcel for one outside of the creek. Uh, lots of ideas for transforming some of the suburban infrastructure into green gutters that could intercept some of the, uh, the uh, water that's flowing from upland to downland. Um, and uh, most importantly, a way to increase housing options by, uh, for lowlanders by, by using these obligations to move people out of harm's way into high opportunity areas. Okay. Um, so uh, I talked a little bit, and just in my last minute here, um, that's one example for housing. What about public space? How can we use that? How can we use investments in resiliency to create uh, more inclusionary public space? And for that, we turn to the Jersey Coast, right? And so I'm not going to go into too much detail about this project, except to say that New Jersey's beaches are very prone to erosion, but they're also very prone to the erosion of the public's right to access and enjoy the beaches. Uh, so we were protected, uh, access is protected through the public trust doctrine, right? Uh, which gives us the right to access the beach. But, uh, you know, on a day-to-day -day level, unimpeded beach access remains something of a phantom, and so towns refrain from building parking lots and paths and bathrooms and adopt all kinds of restrictive parking regulations and things. So we spent a lot of time, and here's some, you know, stories that we looked at, and we spent a lot of time looking at beaches and looking at how towns and individuals employ all these incredibly clever ways to keep people off the beach, like in this case, building a fake garage, so you get a fake curb cut so no one could park on the beach in front of your house. Uh, this is a, we, we see this all up and down the coast. We looked at this situation where, uh, where, a ta where this community built these, put these fake uh, no, no parking signs 
uh, in front of in front of the beach. They're completely fake here. We mapped every single one of them. So there's the ocean at the bottom. Uh, and uh, anyway, so we've been looking at looking at this a lot. And what we use this competition to do is a way to think about um, how. Uh, how to bundle flood protection measures with increased beach access. No time to go into detail, but we really looked at different ways that we could create these lateral collection connections, right, and create uh, pl places that give people legitimate, real beach access. So yes, resiliency and uh, equity are, are two different things. Uh, let's remember that uh, they're two different things, but they also uh, taste great together. Okay, that's all. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. And finally, uh, Nigel Jacob from the Boston Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics. That is a strange clicker. Anyway. Great. Uh, thanks very much for having me. So I'll try to go through this as quickly as I can so we can uh, chat with each other. Thank you. Uh, so whenever I talk about our work in New Urban Mechanics, um, I always try to start out with the why. Why do we do this work? Why is it important that we create, find a way to create a culture of innovation and drive innovation uh, in the public sector, inside local government? Increasingly, uh, local governments are being asked to take part in a whole range of big challenges that we face in our cities. Issues like uh, multi-generational uh, urban poverty, uh, a crumbling uh, physical infrastructure, and increasingly, obviously, the, the effects of climate change. Um, and in each of these ideas, in each of these instances, can I go back? Um, there is a question as to whether or not government is actually up to the challenge. Can we rise to the point of being able to develop uh, innovative, creative solutions that can take on these approaches in a thoughtful way? And so in Boston, we've developed an approach to that, I think, that is uh, very different than the way that we usually think about the powers of, of, of government in terms of like big long-term, only big long-term planning, but that's something that's more uh, dynamic and iterative and prototype driven. So the good news is we have a boss um, that is very supportive of the work that we do. So uh, New York Mechanics was started in 2010 under uh, Mayor Menino at the time. And when Mayor Walsh took office uh, almost a couple of years ago, he asked us to stick around and keep doing what we had been doing. So the, the question is like, what is it that we do in your mechanics? And how, how, what is this mechanism that we've, we've figured out uh, to drive innovation? What we've discovered is that there are innovators throughout government, just as there are innovators throughout the community. And the, the challenge has been that there's just never been a mechanism to surface those people, to give them a, a, a means to, to actually engage in the creative work that they want to be able to do. So that's what we do in New York Mechanics. New York Mechanics is a uh, public innovation R&D lab and incubator. So on the left-hand side there, you see our, 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 our broad approach to sourcing problems, challenges, and opportunities. So we, we keep our ears to the ground, we talk to community groups, we talk to individuals, we talk to our, our uh, peers in local government, uh, we talk to universities, and we talk to everyone that we can think to talk to, to understand what the issues are and look for opportunities. And we are always looking for things uh, that we could test. So that is our secret sauce, right? We're, we're prototypers, we're experimenters in this laboratory, we're not just thinkers. Um, so the, the, the funnel on the left, as you can see, as it constricts, that, the, the, the constriction there is, is us looking through these different opportunities to actually turn them into, into things that we can test and experiment with. Um, and what we often find is that a lot of the things that come our way are things that are very difficult or, or too expensive to, to try out or to prototype, and so those things kind of fall to the wayside. But there are a, a, a subset of those things that, we, that are amenable to experimentation and prototypes that we end up uh, working with. So the middle there, you can see that we actually test it. We run them. And these are literally, literally experiments. We will pick a place, we'll pick a group of people, we'll, we're, we're, we have a hypothesis, we're looking for certain kinds of results. Because our interest is in testing things that have the capacity, when scaled up, to have big impact on people's lives, a positive impact on, on your quality of life. That's what we're always looking for. And so that's what, what happens at the end of the little run the experiment uh, uh, kind of uh, middle part there. And it, although it looks vaguely linear, it is not linear. It is, it is very messy and is very much in the weeds. You know, it's all about, you know, iteration and trying things a million different times um, to, to see if we can make it work. But then at the end, once we've gathered enough insight from whatever the, 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 the prototype was, there's this moment of assessing whether it 
it, a scale or fail moment. You know, did this thing work or did it not? If it didn't work, if for whatever reason we couldn't um, figure out um, a way to make this prototype work, we try to shut it down as quickly as possible. So it's a, a fail fast um, psychology. But on the other end, on the other side of that, if it worked um, and we can understand or we have a sense as to how to scale it, that's, we do that. And the reason that works is that at the outset, at the beginning of the process, we make sure that the, the city operations departments that would need to be involved in the scaling of whatever that, this, this new program practice services, they're involved. So we're never in this position of dropping crazy ideas on people. We're always, we're always trying to solve real world problems that uh, the community and city departments are facing. So over the almost seven years of doing this work, uh, we've uh, learned lots of lessons, more than three lessons. Uh, but I wanted to share a, f uh, a few lessons here, these three in the context of the discussion that we're hoping to have. So briefly stated, um, and again, these may not seem like rocket science, but they're, they're important things for us to consider, especially um, driving innovation in the public sector. The first thing is build things that people actually want or, and or need. This is actually, in a lot of ways, for governments, um, a new concept. We're used to building things that we are required to, de to de uh, deploy, right? We don't usually build things from the perspective of, do people actually want it? Is this a service that people want to be able to use? Number two, take it to the streets, right? We have, there's lots of efforts out there to try to move everything online, make everything ethereal, you know, put on a web page or something. And for some things, there is, there is value to that. But we have found that some of the most impactful things that we can do is to put it where people spend most of their time in terms of at street level, where you can interact with it, where you can occasionally trip over it, maybe not, um, but where you can see it and interact and touch it and taste it. Um, that's an important part of it. And then uh, thirdly, um, encouraging and enabling civic behavior. We have found that to be an important consideration when we think about like why would you want to use this kind of service? So I'll dive into these. I'll give you some examples as to how these things play out. The first, um, build things that people want or need. So if you were a public school parent in Boston up until fairly recently, this was the main way that you had to approach registering your kid for school, right? This pamphlet, as you can see, I made no attempt to make it readable because it's, it's ugly and it's scary. And frankly, it keeps people from reading it because it is so dense. And there's a problem in that because if you, as, as many of you may know, Boston has an algorithmic lottery system essentially um, for determining which kids can go to which schools. And an important starting point for that process is that you as a parent have to list your top three schools. So if you don't get this, the school department, those top three schools, your options for the schools that you want have just gone down the tubes. And therein lies a huge equity problem because what we often find it is the parents that are most socioeconomically challenged or have or we find sort of the, the sort of the least amount of education or that don't speak English, those are the folks that aren't registering their kids for school. That's a problem. So we've created a systemic uh, inequity with, by, tr by, by trying not to do that. We've done this. So we realize there's something that we can do here. To fix the problem behind this, this um, pamphlet is, is tough, right? So Boston, it'll take multi years, it'll take a lot of uh, community discussion and problem solving and so on. But we realize in your mechanics that there are things that we can do prior to that. It doesn't always have to be long term. We can turn this experience into this experience. This is essentially the hotels.com for schools, right? So this allows you as a parent to, to look at your schools, kind of compare them side by side, just as you would expect to be able to do when you're planning a trip somewhere. It's designed to be elegant, fun to use, and so on. This is a game changer, I think, for us. Looking at the design, focusing on the experience that our residents have in interacting with government services. This is another one that we, that we built out a couple of years back. It's called Where's My School Bus? And it does exactly what you think it does, what it should do, right? It tells you where your kid's school bus is. But what's important about this is that this is a piece of technology that you only need maybe, depending on the year, uh, maybe five times per, per, per school year. Basically, whenever there's inclement weather, whenever there's a blizzard, you're standing out in the corner, you need to know where that bus is. Is it late? Is it not coming? Have you missed it? These are the kind of things that parents... In, 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 with great passion tell us that they want to be able to have at their fingertips. Now you could try calling into Boston Public Schools uh, transportation department. <laughs> right, so I won't even fit. So, but everyone will have, else will have the same idea and all, the, the lines will be jammed. So when we roll this out uh, a few years back um, in pilot forum, this is one of the, the pieces of feedback that we got from parents. It, it, this is basically saying, 
uh, the school, you know, the, the bus is late yet again, but the app is, is pretty cool, thanks a lot. So this may not seem revolutionary, but I think this is revolutionary. Because what this says to me is that we're beginning to reset the expectations of our residents as to the quality and the, the kinds of experiences and tools that we can be building for them in response to the things that they're asking us for. The second one, take it to the streets. So Boston uh, has a uh, really uh, challenging uh, street level environment. Um, a few years ago, I think Boston was listed as, if not number one, but like in the top three or four uh, worst biking cities in the country. So we weren't proud of that. So we realized that there were things that we need to do. But one of the things that we, when we looked at, like what are the things that we in newer mechanics could, could take on, we realized there, was, there were some near-term opportunities. I mean, there's a whole issue around, you know, bike lanes and so on. And so the transportation department was, was handling that. But one of the things that happened a couple of years ago was that a couple of bikers were killed by trucks that were driving by them uh, fast enough where the backwash of the car of the truck it pulls the bikes underneath. This is this is sort of a, a well-known phenomenon. Um, so essentially, as the car the truck goes by you, people get sucked under the wheel well. It's pretty gruesome. So we realized there's something that we can do to fix this. You essentially, put cow catchers on the sides of trucks. Right? These are called bike guards. This is not rocket science, right? But this is a, a concrete way that we can save lives and be innovative by using essentially um, kind of off-the-shelf technology. And we've begun to see uh, different cities and states, uh, especially uh, this state, this city and state um, in the region, begun to, to deploy these, um, these bike guards. One of the things that we're, we're very interested in, we've also realized that Doing things at street level, level also affords us the ability to play with the physical infrastructure at streets. So this is a project that we did a few years back um, called Pulse of the City. And the idea, so this was a blend of public art and public infrastructure. So this is about the size and, and shape, or size and height of a parking meter. And the idea is that you go up to this thing, no instructions, you, gra you grab onto it, onto those two handles, uh, silver handles on the side there, and it samples your heart rate and then plays back music in sync with your heart. And so we would see people jumping up and down <laughs> to, to, get the, to jack their heart rate up, and then they would get a different song, and it, it, was, it was pretty fun. And so th this won't cure cancer, but this does change the way that people interact with the physical environment, which is exactly the kinds of things that we need to be doing in, in cities to, to change the way that we deliver uh, the quality of service to, to, to the public. And so people, people love this thing. The last um, learning I'll mention here is the notion of uh, encouraging and enabling civic behavior. So Boston, like every other community uh, in the world, when we think about how to engage the public, the usual way of doing that is community meetings, as, as Sarah was alluding to. The challenge is that community meetings are often almost perfectly designed for conflict. Right, so there, it sets up people to be in opposition almost right away, and so we were very interested, um, you know, starting a few years ago, um, how do we change that dynamic? How do we change the psychology as people go into the room to discuss a different issue? And we we connected with some with a friend of mine, uh, Eric Gordon, at um, Emerson College, to to look at what if we could turn the the community meeting into a game? What if we could change the the the, the psychological experience that you have. So instead of going into the meeting and then sort of you know, staking out your corner and getting ready to fight, but what if immediately you had to figure out the rules of the game and put you into a different kind of psychology? And so this was the idea. This is a, pl a platform that, that, uh, Eric, uh, that we developed with Eric and his team called Community Planet. And the, the, the intuition here is that frequently in community meetings, there's a lot of people that talk who don't know what they're talking about, right? So the, the notion was, what if you can turn the civic learning component into a game prior to the in-person meeting? So people would be engaging using the game, and, and so the game would take you through a series of missions to, to learn about the issues at hand. Um, so at the other end, and just like any game, you get badges, you can see what other people are doing and so on, with the idea being that the, at the very least, you come out with a, a stronger sense as to what the issues are, and then have the community meeting. And what we saw was a very different kind of interaction. So as you can see, we, we, we changed up the dynamic of like, the, like this structure, like what we have here. So we avoided that and to come up with a more um, kind of peer-to-peer -peer based interaction. And we had listed around the sides these posters that essentially were printouts from the game um, so that people could 
could see the, the, the activity as, to, as, as it had happened up to the point of getting together. And we saw a totally different kind of civic behavior, true civic behavior, I think, in those meetings. And one of the most exciting things that we saw was that young people were able to make their opinions heard um, in intelligent ways to uh, tables full of adults. The last thing I'll mention here is that um, uh, around the notion of civic behavior is that you know there's been a lot of different attempts out there to create these apps now that um, that allow you to report things into the city. So you see a pothole or something, you snap a photo and you send it in. Um, so we've done those as well in Boston. We've had and it's been a, a fa fantastic, fantastic experience for us. This ex uh, sort of uh, is a depiction of how we've thought about these tools. So when we think of these tools, we don't see them as a piece of technology, but we, we see this rather as an opportunity to learn about how people want to engage. And so in watching how people use these tools, it, it allowed us to explore a range of different ideas. One of the interesting things that we saw was that some of the highest end users of, these, of the technology uh, in the first couple of years were city employees, which totally blew us away. To, totally counterintuitive. And when we dug into that to try to understand what was going on, it turned out that the app, which allowed you to, to kind of report these things, did about 60 to 70 percent of what their actual jobs were. And, and the governments the, traditionally had given these same people these big, ruggedized, ugly tablets that they had to use to, to report, you know, close things out once they had fixed the pothole. And of course, they never used them. They'd sat in their trucks. But using something that was elegant, built for it to be in your pocket, it totally changed the way they interact with technology. One of the things that we have often seen, though, as much as these are point-and-click technologies, we see this as an, as an opportunity to move into past the transactional to the relational. So one of the things that we're, we're interested in is if we can build better user experiences, does that change how you as a resident think about um, government? We're trying to move away, trying to push people away from the notion that government is a faceless bureaucracy to a place instead of it simply being a, uh, an awareness that is a enterprise of people helping people. So now with Citizens Connect, um, or it's been rebranded as Boss 3 one um, when you report a request for service, in addition to you know, the little notifications saying, great, we fixed it, got it, thank you, you also get a picture of the team that fixed it, with the notion being, if you can see that Steve, Sally, and Mickey fixed your, fixed your issue, does that change the way that you think about the, 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 the experience? And so we're actually studying this with a, a couple of uh, very smart people at Harvard. And that's all I had. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, those were great presentations. Um, is there a microphone in the audience? Sally? Oh, there's two here. Um, share. Share. Okay. Yeah, for questions. I think. Um, can, can we take one out? And well, so while we're doing that, I guess I guess one one. Are you guys sitting far away from me? Is there? Is that was it, like is that is? I know. I mean, it's okay. I just. Um, so uh, thanks very much. Those are those are awesome. Um, a question for for Nigel and um, and Harriet particularly. I mean, in in this. In the innovation that's driving at the national scale, at the local scale, um, can you talk a little bit about um, how do you how do you get political management, the leadership, to get that comfort level in such experimentation, right? Because the right, it's just the the fear of failure is often pervasive, and so can you just talk a little bit more about that? Uh, no. <laughs> I would say uh, you have to have good leadership. And I think you also have to describe the proposition uh, a little bit differently. I think for so many cities now, innovation is actually a brand. And so if you are not a city that's innovating, you're kind of already losing the global competition. So that also means acculturating folks to the idea that, hey, you might fail because guess what? You can't innovate without the possibility of failure. So that's why we're coming up with these great terms like pilot and temporary. And uh, you know, Jeanette Sadiq Khan with what she did in New York was a great e example of that. So I, I do think in some ways it's gotten a lot easier and we can make it sound like an imperative, 
But I also think that in the same way that the car was the disruptive technology of the 20th century, that the smartphone is the disruptive technology of the 21st century, and that if you're not using that technology and those tools, you're also really falling behind. So you have to innovate. You have to be doing things differently. Uh, plus one to all of that. Um, the other thing I'll say is that uh, innovation is not magic, right? So it, it is not something that you sprinkle pixie dust and it, it magically happens. It's about management, right? It's about setting in place the right kind of uh, cultural elements in your, in your organization to be able to support people taking risks. You can't simply ask people to take risks and expect that it will happen, especially if for the last 20 years their jobs have been to be fiscally conservative and to manage the public right of way and uh, on the tax dollars. Instead, you have to actively manage to create um, support for that. So that could be creating innovation funds, it could be creating uh, organizational structures in which people can be incentivized in some way uh, to, to take risk. And then there's also the simple notion that I think that the simple math is often that all innovation requires risk and as a result could result in failure. Right? So that's kind of a simple equation which simply means that we need to have a way for managing failure. Right? Failure can't simply mean that we fall on the floor. It, it means that we did something in a structured way to learn something so that the next time we won't do that again. And so I think that is the difference that we're seeing now. There's a more kind of uh, uh, disciplined way to think about how to, to bring innovation inside of government now. Um, so one of the things that, that Harriet uh, showed is, it, it was in Duluth was the example, or, um, right, just sort of putting it out there, uh, and, uh, and the, um, I think maybe the good Midwestern guilt complex uh, helped uh, motivate and really, um, as, you, as the word you used, was sort of shamed uh, how folks felt about their community. Um, and uh, so Daniel, in, in some of the work that you were showing us, that there were these rather devious things that were being done in terms of access. What, what happened I mean, and, and, and what changed? And in, in, in what was your approach in sort of exposing that? Right? Well, so far, nothing's really changed. And I think I was really inspired by what, what you said. And I, you've given me so much hope to think that people can be shamed into doing the right thing. I, you know, and, and I, and I, because I, as designers, we, we hope that, right? We hope we can show that opportunity map and be like, this is crazy, like, yeah, you know, do you want this? Is this your city? And I, you know, I'd like to think and I, I hope and I, that, that, uh, that, that that's true, right? That, um, that people are fundamentally good, that people don't want to be exclusionary. <laughs> um, but I've had a lot of experiences where I've just seen the worst of people and like thinking about Long Island, um, boy, like the issue of, <laughs> Like you mentioned accessory dwelling units, right? Like I remember being at a meeting about accessory dwelling units and like the things that people said about like what these things were gonna do to Long Island. Like, you know, you're bringing queens into Long Island. Keep that stuff in the city. You know, like, um, what, were we gonna have a bunch of poor people running around our communities? Like, and I think it's the same thing with the beach access issue, right? That like, I, I, it's so, um, you know, it's like, what changes things, I think, is HUD, like saying, we're gonna like withhold $90 million of funding if you don't like comply with the Fair Housing Act or if you don't comply, you know, with this or that. So I think that we can't forget about, we, we, we have to be hopeful and we have to like be, hope that pe we have to play to people's good sides and good intentions, but, um, I think we have to remember that we have a, a stick too, right? And uh, well, you, 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 HUD has a stick, right? And uh, I think so many, so many of the things that we have and so many of the successes we have are because either HUD was like, we're not gonna give you your sewer money, or right, if you don't do this, or somebody just saying, or in Baltimore, that came out of like a lawsuit, right? Of, of like the ACLU suing Baltimore and saying like, your housing authority messed up and we're gonna sue you if you, if you don't comply. So we have to do both. It's like the, we have to appeal to people, but we have to remember that we've got some good weaponry. I think everything you're saying is exactly true. I, I would just say, even on the issue of accessory dwelling units, uh, the people in Long Island are getting older. Um, a lot of them are gonna outlive their retirement income and they're worried about it. An accessory dwelling unit 
is something that might enable them to stay and age in their neighborhood. Oh, it might also allow other people a chance to live in Long Island. I'm just saying that sometimes what we have to do is think about what are people concerned about? How do we frame our issue in a way that, that captures their interest and solves a problem for them? And then it will, by solving their problem, we'll also solve some other problems. So, yeah. So I think there, there are things that we can do also to change the conversation when we, when we start talking to communities around what they may be losing uh, versus what they may be gaining. Oftentimes, it's kind of the, the sort of knowledge and intuition uh, issue again, that people, they fear what they don't know. And so oftentimes, if you can do something like you know, prototype an ADU, an accessory dwelling unit, and show how it would actually work and that it could be quite beautiful and all these different things, that it's very livable and, it, and, and you can live a good life there, all these things that can help to change the way that people's assumptions about what these different kinds of innovations actually mean in the community. I think that's very possible. Yeah, and it's amazing. I mean, on the ADU situation, we, in Denver, um, uh, we redid the zoning code citywide and remapped the city zoning. and. Uh, it's really hard to do, but um, we did it. Uh, and but there were simple things, you know, like in the 50s, the zoning code made in all the single-family zone districts a minimum lot area of 6,000 square feet, which basically encouraged developer to buy two 25-foot lots, demolish them, and build one big house. Right. So we're losing small houses in, in small lot neighborhoods. People were complaining that we're densifying the city, but I said, well, actually, we lost two houses. We only got one back, so we're going the other way. But just revealing that this is really crazy. Why would we have laws that, that encourage the destruction of our neighborhoods and discourage and reduce affordability? And so we were able to change that, create new zone districts with much smaller minimum lot areas and the possibility of ADU, so actually doubling the dent, quadrupling the density from, from past. Um, any questions from the audience? Um, so, uh, people uh, can look at a lot of things. We're going to ask people to look, of course, at racial and ethnic concentrations of poverty and segregation in terms of housing, but people uh, are looking at health outcomes, they're looking at longevity, they're looking at access to amenities uh, like parks, but also to services and retail, they're looking at uh, transportation access, proximity to jobs, quality of schools, um, almost anything that you would think about. If you were thinking about a place you'd want to live, the kinds of things you would look at to say, is this a good neighborhood or not a good neighborhood uh, for me to be living in? Will I enjoy living there? Will it be convenient? Will it make my life easier or will it make my life harder? Um, those are the kinds of things. And Harriet, are, are the, the index, so, so it's adjusted locally? or what's I, the I'm idea? just saying that once we put the data out, there's our national data, but, but the people who start to look at this, they start to say, wait a minute, what about other disparities? Like, let's look at the totality of things, because the more people that are implicated, the more institutions and issues that are implicated, the more help I might get to make some of these changes. Um, so, yeah, m almost everybody that we worked with was very expansive in their definition of opportunity and the people they brought into a coalition for change. I was going to ask, how can you take... No, I don't think that mic is on. Hello? Yes. There okay. we go. All right. Um, how can you take this mapping approach, and this is for Harriet, and this spirit of innovation to the one resource HUD has, which is losing hundreds of thousands of affordable units each year within the FHA portfolio of dealing with foreclosure, um, not working with public private partnerships, but going through the loan sale, either keeping people in process for years or going through the loan sale process, um, you know, which has been highly criticized. And so as you talk about declining HUD resources, here's the situation where we have lots of neighborhoods across the country where foreclosures are still happening or people are sitting in homes where it's not being solved, that it could be solved. Um, I've had meetings with the White House and HUD about this. Um, my question is, Here's a resource which is totally within HUD's control as to how you, how you handle it. Um, how can you take these kinds of approaches to dealing with that resource, which is, I think, a major one in affordability in the country? So just a little bit of background, and I'm not going to be able to give you a great answer, um, but, but I think that... 
yeah. over the weekend we might be able to, do, to solve it as a group. Um, so the issue is that we have a lot of, we kind of a, still have a foreclosure hangover from the recession. And one of the phenomena that's happening is that, a, well, two things. Uh, there's more renting going on and, and less home ownership, and that seems to be a strong preference that, that's happening even in places where the recovery is you know, in full swing. So maybe this is a generational or other kind of a change. Uh, Wall Street is getting into the business of owning single-family homes and renting out those former single-family homes at a fairly large scale. So one of the issues is the competition. You know, why would Wall Street be involved? Again, the very people that brought us the foreclosure crisis, why would they be involved? Some of it has to do with scale and efficiency. Some of it has to do with the fact that they want to be in this business now uh, versus putting all the foreclosures out from FHA to nonprofits and others um, who might have a very different set of motives and uh, profit needs. Uh, uh, when it comes to housing. So I don't have a good answer for it. Fortunately, it's not my area of HUD, but I think it's a really good question and hopefully we can continue to talk about it. So one more question. Hi, again, this is uh, probably for Harriet mostly too. Uh, but there are states, uh, and speaking specifically about uh, ADUs, accessory dwelling units, there are states that have laws against inclusionary zoning. So what, like Texas, where I'm from, right? Uh, so what, what, what leverage does HUD have actually to try to ease those restrictions? Um, so we've had some favorable decisions uh, in the Supreme Court and other places about disparate impact. And, you know, as a policy matter, as a matter of being successful and not having Congress write laws that prohibit us from doing affirmatively furthering for housing, I personally don't want to start with zoning, personally, um, and, and like outlaw single family zones. I don't want to do that to start. People might get there eventually, but, um, you know, your, your point is a really great point. I think in some ways it's a little bit the example that Nigel is giving us. If places are more successful, if seniors can stay in their housing more successfully, I mean, if it looks, if people look at the problems that it solves, I mean, ADUs are invisible density and invisible affordability. It doesn't change the character of neighborhoods, right? So, like, it shouldn't be an evil that's ADUs, but inclusionary is, is another thing. You, it, it helps to use market forces to get uh, economic integration that otherwise is very hard to do. So I think that when we start to see more and more examples of it across the country that have been very successful in cities that other mayors and governors want to emulate, that maybe we'll begin to address these issues. I think for, for when it comes to IZ, it really is pretty uh, uh, recent in its implementation in the sense that our cities were mostly declining in population until more or less the two, 2000 or 2010 census. And it's really, this is, the, this is the era where we're really seeing, is that a tool that gives us great results or not? Okay, well, uh, let's thank Nigel, Nigel and Harriet and Daniel. Thank you.